coconut. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 200 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Stay tuned for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com just for Trek Geeks listeners. Fansets. Our pins have character. <laughs> That's the best you've ever read that. This episode is also sponsored by Science Division, the makers of the world's first interactive Tribble that you can control with your smartphone. Get the special discount code good for $5 off the adoption of your Tribble later on in the show and find out more at sciencediv.com. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. We are the Borg, and you are listening to the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant. It's the Trek Geeks Podcast with Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. You will listen. Resistance is futile. You must comply. Casting department at Podfleet Command, or at least in the the, 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 the bowels of Podfleet Command, right below the basement, below the, the sub-basement, there's this office, and there's a casting couch, and it's the couch you don't want to sit on, um, and there is where we make all the decisions for who's on the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant and the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Greetings, ladies, children... Sorry, greetings, ladies, gentlemen, children of all ages, and welcome to the Trek Geeks Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bill Smith. So great to be here for episode number 230. We have a great one on tap today to talk about one of the most legendary characters in the Star Trek universe. And joining me to do so, well, let's just say at the casting office, we've been working very hard to try to replace him. He's the Kess of the Trek Geeks Podcast. Ouch. He feels a lot of things, none of them relevant. He's Dan Davidson. Dan, welcome aboard, buddy. Uh, don't get too comfy in that chair. Ouch. He's the cat. Ouch. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That uh, one That one went right through the heart, buddy. But thank you. It's good to be here anyway. You don't have a heart. <laughs> I didn't say it was my heart. Uh, but yeah, episode 230. It's good to be here. By the way, happy 90th birthday to Sean Connery. Just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, Welcome to the Rock. Ninety. Ouch. You know, you look almost ninety. Greetings, Highlander. There you go. Look at it. Look at you, Mister Mister uh, Impersonator. Wow, you're taking my job. You're taking everything. And then I suddenly remembered my Charlemagne. Wow. There you go. See, okay, this that's, is. A, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, right. That's all I know. Oh, all right. Well, they were all good. Thanks, pal. Anyway, let's get back to what we were talking about. Uh, episode two thirty. It's good to be here. Uh, we are continuing. Our Voyager 25 online celebration, because unfortunately we're not getting together anywhere in person to celebrate. So this week, we are going to deep dive into, like you said, one of the most legendary characters in Star Trek history, Star Trek Voyager Season 4, we met her, Annika Hansen, Seven of Nine. That's what we're talking about tonight, buddy. Well, and not only Star Trek Voyager now, because now she's an integral part of Star Trek Picard. I know! That's awesome! <laughs> That was really over the top. <laughs> well, you know, that's why I'm on the casting couch. No. It's yeah, not. no, <laughs> that's not it. Um, yeah, no, it's a, uh, we'll mention a spoiler warning again later. If you haven't seen season one of Star Trek Picard, you're going to want to. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we'll definitely hit that again before we get into the main body of content. But uh, a character that I'm, I'm really glad is back. Um, and then I'm really glad I had a chance to get to know completely when I became a, a completist to watch all of Voyager. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sold on the character initially back when she premiered. Um, but now, I mean, I, I'm a huge seven fan. I got to admit, man. Yeah, I am too. And, and 
I remember the day that we found out that she was going to be on Star Trek Picard. Uh, I was up at our good friend Ken Tripp's place up on Lake Winnipesaukee, and we had just gone for a boat ride. And uh, we were getting – you were sending me messages and because you were watching the San Diego Comic-Con stuff and the trailer came out and boom, there's Seven. You, you, you said the galaxy. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, Seven's back it's, and, and it was great. So I can't wait to talk about that part of her character as well as just everything about her when we saw her in Voyager. Well, I can't wait for you to talk about how people can get in touch with us to tell us some of their favorite favorite seven of nine moments. There's a lot of them, I'm sure. It's it, you know, if you're looking to get in touch with us, uh, you can head right on over to trekgeeks.com/contact, and there you will find a multitude of ways to communicate with us. Let's see, there's Skype chat, there's email, there's even voicemail by way of that big blue button using SpeakPipe. Whatever way you want to contact us, just make it so because we love hearing from you. Plus, there's also the most positive Star Trek group on Facebook. It's called Camp Kittimer. It's our official group, and it's where over 1,700 friends gather to talk Trek. It's always positive, with no bashing or gatekeeping ever allowed. To join the group, head on over to facebook.com slash groups slash Camp Kittimer and be ready to be part of a truly wonderful social experience. And as always, we want to thank our wonderful admins, Haley, Jackie, and Dan, for the amazing job they do running the camp. But also, Bill, please remember that any comments or messages that you leave us in any of these places may be used in a future episode. Back to the rock. (laughs) Thank you, Highlander. You're very welcome. Um, so, uh, there's no, we're not doing any news this week, but there is an announcement that we want to convey to everybody. Mm-hmm. For those of you who are interested or going to Trek Geeks Live, our first ever stage show in uh, downtown Concord, New Hampshire called Why Star Trek Matters at the Bank of New Hampshire Stage, we, uh, it is with heavy hearts that we announce that this show has been canceled as of this week. The venue Bank of New Hampshire Stage will be issuing refunds to anyone who bought a ticket automatically. Um, or if you'd rather use your refund for something else on their calendar or to donate to the Capital Center of the Arts in Concord, New Hampshire, you have that ability too. Um, this was a painful decision for both of us. Um, currently, the state of New Hampshire uh, has social distancing guidelines that would only allow the venue to sell roughly one third of their seats, perhaps slightly less than that. And since this was supposed to be a fundraiser for a great all volunteer organization called Granite State Dog Recovery, Dan, it, it made it really impossible to raise money for them. Absolutely. Very difficult. And as, as, as hard as it is and as disappointed as we are, it is the right thing to do based on what's going on right now. They have been unbelievably gracious with us. Um, They are, they, they put this out there. They let us know what was going on let us make the decision of what we wanted to do. And we decided that it would be the best way. We want to raise money and we can't do that when we can only fill a third of the auditorium. So um, we do want to have it uh, uh, at some point. So I think we're going to look at, hopefully things will be back to normal someday soon. So maybe next year in 2021 towards the fall, we might be able to readdress having it. We are going to do it someday. I can guarantee you, Bill, that as long as you, as you and I are doing this show, we will be doing a Star Trek Live at some point. Um, I'm writing that down. I'm putting it in the book, and I'm stamping it with a rubber seal of approval because it's got to happen because it's going to be a lot of fun. It, it will happen, and we're going to pack that house, and we're going to raise some great money for a great organization, mm-hmm. and it's going to be a great night for everybody involved. But it's going to happen when the world is healthy enough to do it. Right. We could do it with social distancing. We could do it with some other fundraising apparatus. But honestly, we know there are people who would just would not take the chance and go, and we respect that. Um, so um, someday in the future, we will gather, we will do this, we will raise a bunch of money for a great organization, and we're going to have a great time. Absolutely. And i got to say selfishly, for me, if we did do something like this with the social distancing in place and not being able to have as many people... I would still be concerned that somebody could get sick from it. And I would hate to have that on my conscience that someone could possibly get sick because they came to see us um, at an event. So um, I'm, I'm fine with it. It's, it's sad. I mean, it's the second time we've had to move slash cancel the event, but it's for the right reasons because unfortunately there is a runaway pandemic going on in the United States. Um, But we'll get through it. We'll get through it together and we'll do uh, some fun celebrating on stage uh, when the time comes. Now, a couple of people have asked, can they take their uh, their ticket purchase and send that to Granite State Dog Recovery automatically? Unfortunately, we don't have a method by which to do that. However, you can go to GraniteStateDogRecovery.com and donate to them directly through PayPal. 
Um, they do accept donations that way, and that will be just as effective. Um, in the future, in between now and then, we may try to do something to help Granite State Dog Recovery. We're not sure what that's going to look like. This is news that's brand new. Uh, it just happened yesterday as we record this. So yep. um, we're we're exploring all options, Dan. Oh, we, are, we, we are explorers, which is kind of what Star Trek's all about. It is, and part of the reason why it matters. So thank you to everybody who's who's offered their support and their kind words. Um, but uh, th- this event is going to happen someday, and y'all better be ready. Dan, one of the things that really makes being a Star Trek fan and a podcaster so great is the new friends that we have made over the years. And I tell you, that certainly has been the case with Lou, John, and the whole gang over at Fansets. We met them at STLV a few years back, and we instantly became great friends with all of them. That friendship has grown into a great partnership, and we are truly honored to have them as the presenting sponsor here on the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Yeah, absolutely. They know what fans like, and they work so hard to get the very best product for your collections. Every year, they've come out with an incredible collector set series of pins, starting with the Captains a few years back, then TNG 30, DS9 25. Last year, they had the amazing Women of Trek collection, and this year, it's all about Voyager 25. Now, we may not be able to gather in person in a vendor's room at a convention, But you can be sure that when this magnificent collector's edition is ready, it's going to be available to order over at fansets.com. And until that beauty is ready to come out of Space Dock, head on over to fansets.com to check out all the other great stuff that they have to offer, like Harry Potter, DC Comics, The Big Bang Theory, Batman 66, Firefly, uh, Wonder Woman 84. You got that right. And that's only a few of the genres that they have pins for, in addition to Star Trek. And you can be sure that when you buy from Fansets, you're buying from an officially licensed vendor who understands exactly what fans want. So go ahead and head on over to Fansets.com. When you get there, put a whole lot of pins and accessories and even gift certificates into your cart. Because when you spend more than $30, you're automatically going to get free shipping. And then on top of that, for 15% off your entire order, use the special Trek Geeks discount code for this week, Anika. That's A-N-N-I-K-A in all capital letters. This discount code will be available to use from now until Wednesday, September 9th, 2020 at midnight Eastern Daylight Time. Fansets. Our pins have character. And we thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of Trek Geeks. We gathered this week, Dan, to talk about one of our favorite characters in the Star Trek universe, a character that came to Star Trek Voyager almost midway through the series, which is mind-blowing to have a series regular join at that point. Of course, I'm talking about um, Seven of Nine, tertiary adjunct to Unimatrix Zero One. Very nice. I like how you're able to get the full name without any uh, missteps. That's usually my job. Yeah, Jerry Ryan joined the cast, and, and you're right. It's the first time this had really ever happened in a Star Trek series. They didn't have any new car- uh, crew members show up in TNG. Yeah, they had Worf show up in DS9, but he was already a regular in TNG, so that doesn't count. He brought story with him because he bitched about the Enterprise for the first, like, six <laughs> weeks. Um, <laughs> well, well, people could argue that Chekhov was introduced, and he was, but not in the same way. No, not at all. He just showed up. And then Pulaski showed up in season two eh. and then was gone by season three. Ah, eh, Nobody cares about Pulaski. So this is really the first time a sweeping change like this had happened in Star Trek. Absolutely. And it was, it was, you know, the reasons were controversial, but um, they made history. I mean, there's, there's no denying it. Um, it, it. You know, we could have lost, we could have lost a couple different people um, when they yeah. decided to introduce uh, Seven of Nine and Jerry Ryan. Um so I guess we can always uh, discuss why that actually happened because, it, it, you know, as you look at it now with everything going on in today's world with Me Too and all that stuff, you kind of wonder if something like that would ever happen nowadays. You really do. Um, and, and that's something I've considered many times. I think that it would still happen, just not necessarily for the reasons that um, were either rumored or publicized. Yeah. Um, but more about that in a second. I want to talk a little bit about Kess. Sure. Because obviously the, there was a character that was going to be displaced. 
you know, you add another series regular, that's a, that's a huge, huge budgetary concern. Mm -hmm. So they were going to let somebody go. It could have been Harry Kim. It, it could have been Cass. It wound up being Cass. And I, I almost feel bad saying this as much as I appreciate the Cass character. I don't, I get partway through season four and I don't miss Cass. I think that's a testament to what Jerry brought. Okay. I, I really do. Um, because we've talked about it before. Kess was not my favorite character. I have grown to appreciate her more. Um, I think Jennifer did what she could with what she was given. Um, and there were some episodes towards the end of her run on Voyager, which which I like and enjoy. But um, yeah, I, it, it's, it's interesting when I think about that it could have been Harry, because we've talked about this before. I really doubted that they would have gotten rid of a bridge crew member. Even though they got rid of Tasha in TNG, I really yep. don't think they would have done it on Voyager. And when you think about it, that was all that was left was Cass. They weren't going to get rid of Neelix. I, I I don't think there was any chance they were going to get rid of Neelix. Um, and she, I think she was just the, the last one standing, with as weird as that may sound, the last one standing to get cut. And so I'm, I think that's why it happened. But ultimately, I don't think they could have gotten rid of Neelix. Um, no. Because I think that he was too integral to their growth at that point. Mm -hmm. I think there were still plenty of Neelix stories left, whereas I don't really think the writers gave Cass, um, the, as a character, the attention that the character deserved. I feel like she was relegated to sort of second banana status behind either Neelix or the doctor. And she could have been so much more. And I think that's why I don't miss the character in addition to what Jerry brings to seven. I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that there were very few Kess centric, I like that, Kess centric stories to begin with. And I, you got to wonder, are they just out of ideas for what to do with the character? I mean, she only had a few years left to live anyway, right? It was season four yeah. when they got rid of her and she lives to be seven. And how old was she when they picked her up? So, I mean, she was getting close anyway. So, I, looking back, even though it's sad and, and someone had to pay the price, so to speak, for the decisions that they made, I think it was the right decision overall. So uh, and a couple of times this year, you and I have talked about the introduction of Seven and what I like to refer to as the babe factor. Mm -hmm. And there's a story on Memory Alpha about the concept of Seven of Nine. And essentially what happened was, at least according to um, sources that Memory Alpha has cited, Brandon Braga was sitting at home late one night, saw a televised promotion for the third season episode, Unity. And the idea of having a Borg crew person aboard the ship was something that kind of interested him as he was watching the ad. So he calls Joe Minoski, who's also a writer on, on Voyager, and says, hey, what do you think about this? And Minoski thinks it's a great idea. And then they talked about it. You know, what would it mean? Um, you know, well, would it be cool? And then they brainstormed. Because, quote, Braga says, I wanted to make sure it wasn't a stupid idea. Um, it was late, but I was so excited. He really liked the idea, but he had the stroke of genius. Make it a Borg babe, said Braga. And we just talked about it for a couple of hours and we just thought, this is a really cool idea. This could be really just the thing we need. And by that, they mean to jumpstart the ratings. Mm -hmm. So the, the babe factor is, is, is pretty much fact. Um, yes, it is. People have, have long talked about it, long debated it. For whatever else Jerry brings to the table, the idea was to sex Voyager up a little. Absolutely. I mean, they they made it very clear that they wanted to bring in more 18 to 25-year-old males into the show and boost those ratings. And what better way to do that than with someone like Jerry Ryan, who she's she's gorgeous as heaven. She, she's great, and she's got great character development. And right from the get-go, that babe slash sex it up part of Voyager was there. I think in the second episode when she's more human and not a Borg any longer, she runs into Harry in the corridor and she says, oh, your pupils are dilated. You must want to have sex with me or something like that, something along those lines. So they instantly started bringing that part of it in. I think she was doing a, um, I don't know if it was in the holodeck or something that she was doing a painting scene where she was the model. Um, and that was getting everybody kind of, you know, hot under the collar, if I remember correctly. Um, so it was definitely something that they, I think that they, they, 
focused on that at the very beginning and then knew they had a good thing. They knew it was going to be a great character and it was going to be a good character development arc. So they kind of tidied that off a little bit. Well, and that's a great point because what Seven really brings to the table is is quite substantive. Yes. You know, Voyager has the the benefit and the virtue of being a show where women are in more lead roles uh, in, in on the ship mm-hmm. than some of the other shows. Uh, you've got a, a woman captain, you've got a woman chief of engineering, um, and now you've got what amounts to a chief science officer who is a woman. Right. And you've got a really powerful triad of characters there um, who are all exceptional at what they do, who are all incredibly intelligent, intelligent, and who, who all work well with one another, Seven's um, idiosyncrasies notwithstanding. So Seven absolutely adds that to the table because the science vessel, which didn't have a full complement of science people, all of a sudden gets somebody who is probably head and shoulders above mm-hmm. the science staff they have. Sure. And one of the things I like, he said the, the three, the triad, you know, dynamic is great. And one of the things I like so much about it is you had seven in the middle, the captain being the understanding one wanting to bring her humanity out. And then you had Balana and seven who butted heads all the time, but it was in a way that really worked with that character development. I think eventually they became to, they, they came to respect one another. Um, but how easy is it to gain the respect of Balana anyway because of, <laughs> of who she is? And I don't say that in a negative way. I say right. that in a very positive way. Right. Um, but I think that that dynamic of those three strong women on the show really highlights the strengths that each in particular character had. And I like that. I agree with you completely. You know, and plus it, 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 gives, it gives those people who watch Star Trek for the sciencey things – some some really great science to work through because although Voyager had had some in the past, um, they really got to double down on the scientific piece of it, and I think that was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. What was the name of the 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 room that they made uh, that she worked in? It showed all the great pictures of the galaxy. I'm having a mind blank right. Was now. it the Astrometrics Ast- Lab? Astrometrics Lab. That was one thing that I really think. Um, made the seven character that much more of the science officer thing that you were just talking about. It was a great, it was a great, um, technological, um, success for science, for, for special effects on the show itself when they introduced that for the first time. But that was where she was most comfortable when she was in that room. She was always in there. It seemed once it became part of the, uh, show on a more regular basis. And she really seemed to, uh, succeed, so to speak, when she was, when she was doing her thing in there. It also gave Voyager another character in search of their humanity. Mm-hmm. It's something that Star Trek has really kind of always had as a hallmark. In the original series, there was Spock. In TNG, it was Data. In DS9, it was Odo, to some extent. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in Voyager, I mean, people say the Doctor, but the Doctor wasn't necessarily searching for his humanity. Right. He was looking to establish his own identity. Some would say that's the same thing, but... Seven really put that character back on the table for Star Trek mm-hmm. um, because this is a person who had their humanity forcibly taken away from them at such a young age. And at times, she did, she really has no interest in gaining that humanity back, which is another interesting aspect of her character. Yeah. There were several episodes where she wanted to go back to the Borg. Um, one that comes to mind is um, uh, one we'll probably talk about later is, is uh, Dark Frontier. Um but the, when they reintroduce the Borg Queen and she's kind of torn as to what she wants to do. And, you know, you can't really blame her. She was a Borg. She became a Borg when she was, what, six, eight, something like that? Somewhere in there. Um, and she's probably in her mid-20s at this point. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's great that they that they have that, that – or that she has that tug of war with her humanity going on constantly. Well, that's a great term you use. It is a tug of war. Um, I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but – Um, you're not wrong. It's this constant push and pull of, am I Borg or am I human? And that, that's really kind of something that's delicious for, or I have to believe it's delicious for an actor to play. Uh, and Jerry just does it so easily. Um, it, it makes me wonder, are there times where seven is too detached and too dispassionate? And was that a defense mechanism? Um, I think it, I think it was a defense mechanism. I think it was, um, because she was afraid. And I mean, cause let's, let's be honest. 
when you have to when you, when you're thinking about the two Borg and humanity, there are times when her Borg part really helped the crew. She has all the knowledge of these species that they've assimilated. She knows all their defenses, and she has all of this knowledge that she got as by being part of the collective. And it helped a lot, a lot. I mean, I think right in the very, I mean, she was still part of the collective in, in Scorpion Part 2, but they are able to to add technology to Voyager to help them uh, stave off Species 8472. So there are very, as strange as it sounds, there are positive aspects of her Borg part of her conscious or of her struggle. But at the same time, you want to let that control you for the rest of your life. So then you have to deal with the humanity part, which I think she was very afraid of doing because she had no idea what it was like to be human. And, and and the irony is, is that one of the people trying to guide her through that was somebody who wasn't even <laughs> a, 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 a bio centric life form. <laughs> uh, you know, she's got the doctor trying to guide her through this and he's essentially just an amalgam of the Voyager computer. That's right. Yep. Photonic. Yeah, photonic the, life form. I love the phrases they came up with these different life forms. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And and that's something that we talked have talked about several times and we'll probably talk about more is that relationship with Seven and the Doctor was a good relationship. I think it became a little bit overdone towards the end of the series. Yeah. But I don't know. I look at it as this. As part of the Borg, she was very heavy into technology. I mean, you know, most of her was was a simil- you know, was was technology you know, forced into her body. The doctor is technology. Maybe that's why she was so comfortable with him. And the fact that he wasn't real, quote unquote. Yeah, no, I agree with that. He was real to me, Bill. (laughs) (laughs) He's real to me too, Dan. (laughs) Okay. Um, You were right on the timing. She was assimilated when she was six. Oh, okay. She was separated from the collective at 24. Nice. And I didn't even look that up. I looked it up, and uh, interesting at uh, when she helps uh, or in Star Trek Picard. I'm not going to say any more before we talk about spoilers later. Uh, she's 49. Oh, okay, excellent. All right, so there you have it. Boom. Um, that's that's fascinating. Um, I, I think that really one of the best ways to examine Seven is to look at her relationships because they run the gamut. They really do. Yeah, they Everything do. from trusted confidants to um, people that annoy her <laughs> to people she constantly butts heads with. Um, and sometimes those are the same people. <laughs> but you know what's It's like talking to you. Isn't that, I was going to that's a very good point because isn't that what humanity is all about? You're going to yeah. have, you're going to have relationships that are going to be contentious and great and scary and all of these different things she's experiencing it for the first time at 24 as you just pointed out so uh interesting it's a, a, a few uh, not long ago we we talked about captain janeway and how great that character was and probably for me the most prominent and most important relationship that seven has is with janeway because janeway serves as sort of that i hate i hate using the term mother figure um i want to say that is. that that sort of guide, that sort of teacher about Parental. what, yeah, but see, but I almost don't like referring to it as a parent sense, even though that may be what it boils down to, because I, I think that what Janeway tries to teach her is so much more, um, all encompassing because not only is she trying to teach her how to be human, she's trying to teach her how to fit in amid a group of people, how to fit in with Starfleet. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like she's trying to be her sensei in a way. Um, to, ha- to guide her through this this murkiness that is her newfound humanity. Um, you may very well be right. Maybe it's just because I don't like the term, because um, I almost feel like I'm relegating Janeway to a stereotype in a way. Does that make sense? It does make sense. One of the other things I think is very interesting, at least in the very beginning through probably at least the first half of season four, if not even a little bit longer, is she's trying to help um, help Seven deal with uh, relationships with people that don't trust her at all. And yeah. at any point think that she's going to stick her nanoprobes in your neck and you're going to be part of the collective. So, well, and realistically that that's a danger at a couple of, t- at a couple of different it, it, points. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So it does, it, it is always possibly there ready to go. To go what? <laughs> I can't wait to hear that sounds 
<laughs> when people download this. It's going to sound fantastic, <laughs> I'm sure. It's going to be their ringtone. No. <laughs> I can guarantee it will not be a ringtone. Maybe for Adam the intern. Possibly. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. He'd, um, yeah, he'd do that in a heartbeat. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that Seven and Janeway relationship is is kind of key. But I think that Janeway learns almost as much from Seven as Seven does from her. Absolutely, she does. Um, because Janeway learns about um, what it means to give that or help somebody discover that humanity. And I think for times we take that, at times we take that for granted as humans because our experiences are what they are. And to deal with a human being that's never had them Mm -hmm. has got to be a really daunting challenge. And I think one of the things that Janeway does best is she learns from the positive experiences as well as from the very negative experience that come with this relationship that she has with Jane, uh, with, uh, with, with seven. Um, there were things that happened that she didn't expect and she was disappointed about baby seven's reaction to something. She takes all of that. She doesn't just keep the good stuff and throw away the bad stuff. She learns from all of it. And I think that's another, uh, you know, we're talking about seven this week. It's another great aspect of, of Catherine Janeway. Well, and it shows that, that seven does take that teaching very well. Mm-hmm. You know, she, it, it, there's a lot of lessons, hard lessons she has to learn. Uh, unfortunately, there's only one way to learn them, which is by doing. And uh, there are times where she's successful and doesn't understand. And there are times where she's not successful and is sometimes okay with it. Did you just quote Star Trek too? We learned by doing who's been holding up the damn elevator. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she changed her hair. I hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, uh, yet we digress. Um, <laughs> another relationship that I think is, is tantamount to Seven's uh, evolution into humanity or reassimilation into humanity, because that's really what it is, has, we talked about a little bit just a moment ago, the doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, the photonic life form, which teaches her more about some of the nuances of being human and some of the smaller ticket items. Um about things that make you joyful, about things that help you disconnect, about things that help you figure out who you are. Um, and all I can think of is is the song You Are My Sunshine in moments like that, um, <laughs> I, as much as I can't stand that song. Well, who better to do that? The captain's not going to do it. She's nope. the captain. She has to have this, you know, distinction about her that she's, you know, the captain. And she's not going to get that from Balana because Balana wants to just punch her right in the throat box. Um, and she's not going to get that from Harry because Harry's very nervous around. There's nobody on the ship really who is a human or a real life form who's going to do that. Sure, Tuvok has a relationship with her, which we can talk about later, but. The doctor's really the only one that can do that. And I don't think it really bothers him to do that. She could talk to Cass. Oh, wait. Oh, ouch. That was <laughs> harsh. She wouldn't know what to do. She'd just be walking funny down the hallway after. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're terrible. I know. I'm um, sorry, Cass. No, but, you know, we, we, we talked about the Doctor and Seven of Nine show. Yes. But there's a reason why those two characters kept winding up together. Like you said, it, it probably had a lot to do with Seven's comfort level with him because he wasn't completely human. He had knowledge, and at times she just didn't understand why it was relevant, but it always turned out to be so, and I think that's pretty important. Plus, it helped the Doctor realize that he had something to offer in being a teacher of humanity. And, and in a way, they kind of helped each other discover those qualities, I think. Do you think that possibly real life had something to do with how they became the Doctor and Seven show for a while? There's, It's no secret that, that Kate and um, Jerry had some friction when they were filming. That's been documented. They've talked about it, and they've, they've made up and, and now um, – have great times on stage together. But do you think that it was possible that the writers knew about that? So kind of steered it in that direction during the later years of Voyager? No, I think if anything, they probably would have tried to avoid it like the plague. Um, Because, you know, when you have that kind of dynamic on set, I have to believe the last thing you want to do is write about it. Okay. Um, Because that's just going to potentially make it worse. At least that's my perception. Oh, well, what I mean is because of that friction between Kate and, and Jerry, they, purposely went 
to someone else. And it's obvious oh. that, that that Picardo and Jerry had a great uh, dynamic in front of the camera. So maybe they created more plot stories for them to kind of avoid that friction that was known to have happened uh, during filming with, with Kate. I see what you're saying. It's possible. Yeah. Um, I, I think that they just felt that those episodes resonated better mm-hmm. um, for some of those lessons. Okay. Um, I think they felt maybe they could take more chances because True. Janeway's the captain. I mean, yep. you know, she has to be a certain way at certain times and the doctor isn't, you know, yep. the doctor is, is on a path of discovery himself and what better than to have two people discovering these things together. That's, that's my take on it. Oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, but I didn't value that relationship, um, years ago when I would get frustrated with Voyager, Mm -hmm. I didn't see the value in it. And now, uh, now that I've actually had a chance to bond with the series and I've become a huge fan of Voyager, um, I have to say I do. Um, and it, it, seven is not the same character without that relationship. I absolutely agree. And, and we've talked about it so many times, our re my rewatch and you're completing the series really gives us a better appreciation for, I, I got to say, man, for probably every single aspect of the show. And that relationship certainly is, is one of them. Bill, we love to talk about science division and their fantastic interactive tribble. You know, we've seen these little fur balls for years, and now Jay and Kaylea have taken Tribbles to a whole new level. You know, they really have. The Science Division Tribble doesn't just look good sitting on your shelf. Oh, no, my friend. This Tribble is interactive, just like you said. They have three modes. There's at ease, where they're happy and content, like they don't know who Dan Davidson is. There's on duty, which is a random mix of happy and angry sounds, like maybe Dan Davidson's in the neighborhood. And then there's Watchdog, when you can be sure that Dan Davidson is right in your midst, because you can smell him. Now, you don't have to use the app to enjoy your Tribble, but if you do, there's also an attack button, which makes your Tribble scream on demand at friends, family, or co-hosts named Dan Davidson who make your ears bleed. Wow. I love that. And, you know, Science Division has <laughs> just received a brand new shipment of Tribbles direct from the Tribble homeworld, and they are ready for adoption right now. And I've got to tell you, Bill, I've seen the photo of all those brand new Tribbles, and I am here to tell you, my dear, dear friend, that indeed, you know what's coming. The Tribbles are not dangerous. <laughs> They're not dangerous, <laughs> even in large numbers. Uh, I don't know where Jay and Kalia are storing a silo full of Quadro Triticale to feed them, uh, but that's a story for another time, I guess. What is it with you anyway? I, I just, you know, what is wrong with you? Dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy your triple right now at sciencediv.com. And when it arrives, you can download the Section K7 app on your iOS or Android device, give it a name, and even choose what ship you want it to be assigned to. Plus, if you order your triple today, Science Division will give you a special $5 off the adoption of your triple. So head on over to sciencediv.com to place your order. And at checkout, be sure to enter the special code RAVEN. That's RAVEN in all capital letters, R-A-V-E-N. Use that code and you'll get $5 off your adoption now through Wednesday, September 2nd at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. And we thank our friends at Science Division for sponsoring this week's episode. (laughs) That's so RAVEN. Wow, that was awesome. Well, and Seven also gets to play teacher at some point, you know, to different people. Mm -hmm. This person who is so new to their humanity and almost in an infancy of sorts has to deal with children. And there's, there's Naomi Wildman. Naomi Wildman. Who who she develops a wonderful relationship with. I love the dynamic between those two characters, but also the stupid board kids. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know it's you know what's sad i can't remember any of their names except each of them. <laughs> that makes me feel bad <laughs> i had to i had to look them up yeah there's uh rebbe azan and mizadi okay i think i got those names right because i'm reading them off of memory alpha no matter what their names are uh seven of nine will never pronounce them as good as naomi wildman <laughs> There's actually a YouTube video out there that you can you can go check where every instance of Seven of Nine saying Naomi Wildman in succession and it's it's music. <laughs> because I'm sure it's pretty close to the same every single time. <laughs> it's exactly the yeah. same. <laughs> yeah. Um so I mean Seven gets to 
make friends with Naomi Wildman and act as a sort of adult figure in her life. Mm -hmm. But Seven has a very different relationship with the stupid board kids because she has to be a sort of pseudo parent. You know, they're separated from the collective. She was separated from the collective. They have this commonality in their backgrounds and she's got to help them navigate that as young adults. But isn't it interesting that that's really the only thing they have in common is the separation from the collective. They're not the same race. Um, They are different ages and she kind of, I think, feels responsible for them. Yes. Only because they share that same um, being cut from the collective. And that's kind of interesting when you think about it. I mean, that's, it's, I don't know if that's something I would do. I mean, call me crazy, call me mean, call me non human, but I don't know if I'd have the same feeling. Well, there's something in shared trauma, mm-hmm. you know? That's true. Um, they have this experience that was, was very. Um, well, to, just, to say it's very unsettling just doesn't do it justice because it caused seven pain mm. to be separated from the collective and she felt alone yep. and and afraid probably for the first time in her life since she was assimilated. And these kids are much you know younger than, than she was when she was separated. So I, I think she felt a responsibility in that sense because she had done it already herself. Yep. And if anyone could guide them through that process being as young as they are, um, it was her. I I have to say, in all honesty, and I'm not I'm not trashing anything when I say this. That aspect of the seven storyline with the board kids is my least favorite, and the one I am least interested in. Yeah, I've never I've never connected with it in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, I don't know why. Um, maybe it's the whole kids thing in Star Trek just doesn't work for the most part. Although I love the relationship we had with Naomi Wildman because I think Naomi Wildman like worshipped her. She just was like her eyes were just like, oh my God, it's seven or nine whenever they were together. Um, <laughs> just with the with the with each having the kids, it just even with the it, with the important things that took place with each have in Voyager, spoiler alert, and later, um, it, it just never rang with me. No, I agree with you. Um, in fact, I call them the stupid board kids because I think it was the the dumbest development <laughs> in Voyager. Hey, we got four board kids. They're orphaned. Let's let's make you their mom. Well, you know what I think they did? I, I think they tried to catch lightning in a bottle twice. They did it with Jerry, with Seven of Nine, bringing a Borg onto Voyager. So they're like, hey, this worked great. Let's try it again with something different. And I just think it failed. <laughs> People are going to hate this analogy. But here I am with it. Um, So remember when the – we talked about the $6 million man before. Yes. Remember when they introduced Jamie Summers, the bionic bionic woman? Yes. Remember partway through the bionic woman, they gave her Max the bionic dog. Max the bionic German shepherd. Yep. Dumb idea. Yep. (laughs) The bored kids are are Voyager's bionic dog. (laughs) Nice. I like the analogy very much. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Please direct all hate mail to Dan at – no. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, I'll give one that other people can get mad at me about. It's Oliver on the Brady Bunch. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Or Tiger. <laughs> tiger. <laughs> oh, geez. Wow. Um, I, although I do think that Seven was improved by those relationships, as much as I didn't like the introduction of those characters, I think it solidified her own humanity and her ability to feel comfortable in her own world because she had to set some of that apprehension aside to guide these individuals. And and I think it worked. I, I think the kids felt the same way, especially uh, Icheb, because of what he does for her when she's possibly yeah. going to die. Yep. He sacrifices by giving up his cortical node yep. so that she can have it so that she'll survive. So there is definitely a bond between them. I just never really saw the bond as I had hoped to see it. No, and I agree with that. I think that's a that's a fair statement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking of bonds that aren't there, Dan, oh, is this a James Bond? <laughs> bond, James Bond. Oh, he, oh, wow! So many Sean Connery. Right? There's a Sean Connery callback. <laughs> um, he's so, ninety this year. Shatner's going to be not, ninety in March. Yeah, Sean Connery turned ninety two days ago. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. Um, speaking of uh, bonds. N- bonds that really just are, are not there, let's talk about oh. Seven and Chakotay. 
Oh boy, do we have to? I feel like we can't get out of a discussion on seven without talking about this non-existent relationship. Why did they do this? <laughs> I think even Jerry has said in interviews that she thought it was just awful. I think Robert Beltran has said the same thing. Okay, good. Uh, it just it did it, it came out of nowhere for one thing. Oh my god, it like literally came out of nowhere, and if, then it just didn't go anywhere. In fact, I think they thought you know that the, the Jerry and Robert thought they were hinting at it at one point during season seven, and the writer said, "No, no, we're not doing that." And then they get the finale script, and it's like, "What are you talking about?" Oh, yeah. I, th- I I could have that wrong. That's a story I've heard. I don't know how true it is. Okay. Um, that is a relationship that I still don't understand to this day. I, You know what? <clears throat> you got the Seven and Chakotay relationship, or you got the Janeway and Chakotay relationship. And I will tell you 100 times out of 100, I'm picking Catherine and Chakotay. And I will, I that you can never talk me out of that. I, it just that's that's just me. I I see a bond with Chakotay and Janeway. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yep. I never saw one with Seven and Chakotay. No. Still doesn't make sense to me. No, it really doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. It really doesn't. And I don't know if it was just was the. Could you see it in the chemistry with the actors when they were working together that it wasn't there? Because you know, because we talk about it, and we of course we know that they both didn't think that it was the right thing. So maybe it's you know with non rose colored glasses that I see that, but I, it just, you know, there's some relationships that you see people in and they're like, yeah, that just doesn't work. And that was one of them. I think that as actors, they could have pulled off whatever they were given. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's um, a good point. I, I think that, you know, that, that Beltran and, and Ryan had a, a, probably a fine working relationship. I think they worked well together on screen, but for that jump to go from first officer Borg science officer to, hey, let's have a picnic. I'm going to beam into your quarters. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. And that's, see, that's, that's not a euphemism. (laughs) No. That's what she did. (laughs) I did not want the crew to get the wrong idea. (laughs) Yeah. What do you think the transporter chief was thinking? (laughs) Oh, she would have wiped the logs. Come on. Well, that's not Starfleet, Bill. Yeah. We never do that in Star Trek. Freaking Alex Kurtzman, he's fired. <laughs> so sad that they canceled Picard season two. Uh, <laughs> th- th- they didn't, people. That's a joke. No, they didn't. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm so bummed they canceled Lower Decks, which is producing its second season right now. Um, <laughs> We're digressing. In a they big didn't. Way. They didn't. Yeah. No. No. Um, <laughs> so before we go any further, we oh. should. Let people know that we are about to talk about developments in Star Trek Picard Season 1. Yes. Which does have Seven of Nine. That's a well-established fact. That in itself is not a spoiler. Mm -hmm. From here on in, there will be spoilers. So if you have not watched Star Trek Picard Season 1, you might want to go and watch it or fast forward about 10 minutes. Wow. That was was almost the spoiler alert that I give on Discovering Trek. Well done. Thank you. I've heard it enough times. I know. It's pretty good. It's a good earworm. Yeah. So at this point in her life, by the time 2399 rolls around, because that's when Star Trek Picard takes place, um, Seven is much older. She is more uh, comfortable is not the right word. No. Um, she is more used to being human. She's a pirate. Um, <laughs> well, she's a ranger. Yeah. I got kind of like a pirate. I, I almost <laughs> kind of think of her like a vigilante. Yeah. That's a space true vigilante. Yep. Okay. She's space Batwoman. <laughs> okay. Well, space because Charlie, what, uh, what's the Death Wish guy? What's his name? Charles Bronson. There you go. Space Charles Bronson. <laughs> because she goes around um, fighting the fights that, that need fighting for people who mm. can't do it themselves. Yeah. You know, it's, it's she's like the A-team. Oh, that's pretty good. I never watched that. Um, and, and she's somebody who is is very jaded. Yeah. You know? And it's um, sad to see it, too. It is, but I, I have to wonder if that wasn't the only way it could have worked out. True. Because let's be honest, as as great as the future is supposed to be in the world of Star Trek, humanity can be very disappointing. And I'm glad that we see that in Picard, which some people criticize. I think it's very important that we see that that is still the case. Well, humans fail other humans all throughout all Star the- Trek. Absolutely. But and all some the time people now. seem to think that with this Gene's vision that we always talk about, that that just doesn't happen. And I'm glad that 
that was something that we got to see quite a bit of in Picard, actually. Yeah. But part of what propels Seven and drives her is this want of vengeance because of the the murder of Echeb. Yes. Which was- Well, I guess murder of Echeb is not correct. Um, I take that back because of the way Echeb had to die. Right. Um, with what was going on, I can't remember the woman's name that, that was- uh, Bejazel. Thank you. Bejazel was- you know, trying to get this Borg technology and, 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 uh, each have got to the uh, alpha or beta quadrant, depending on where they were at the time was captured and was tortured pretty bad. I mean, I got to say, I don't mind it, but I totally understand that some people had a problem with the violence in the each have scene of that one episode because it was pretty brutal. It was a little gory. It was gory. And, um, he's, he's a, not in any good condition and seven shows up and kills the doctors that are, that are torturing him. And as a matter of fact, we talked about the cortical node um, a little while ago. At one point, he's they're drilling into his eye socket. Um, and she's like, come on, where's that little cortical node? Where is it at? Where are you hiding that thing? So he doesn't have it. So, But Seven shows up. And because of everything that he's gone through, she has to kill him so that he doesn't suffer anymore. And that, based on the relationship that they had, which we just talked about, we might not have seen the strong relationship, but there was that connection because of what he did for her when she was facing death. And she had to kill the person that saved her life because of what he had gone through with this with this group of, of bad people in Picard. It's essentially a mercy killing. It is. And it's it's brutal to watch. I mean, Jerry does a great job with that scene. It really is. And I, I understand at that point when she sees Bejazel later on in, in the episode Stardust City Rag, why she essentially executes her. Yeah. Which... Man, that was I. I didn't. I. I don't know about you, but I didn't expect that for her to show up again and to just vaporize her like that. That was. Like, I did. Whoa. It was. I mean, that's that's how broken she is. Yeah, that's what I looked at it. But the one thing I do not to go off on a just to go off on a tiny tangent. I did find it interesting that Ichab was in Starfleet, or at least it looked like he was. He had a uniform on with a com badge and everything. Yeah, he so was I in Starfleet. Was, I thought that was interesting that he finally did get into Starfleet. I. I think that's the logical progression because I think that Janeway would have inspired that in him. Yeah. And I think that the other officers on Voyager would have inspired that. Honestly, by the time he gets back, he's prime age for the Academy. Yeah. When did, was he with them when they got back? Yeah. I thought for some reason he dropped off somewhere. That's Maybe that's why I thought it was odd that he was in Starfleet. Oh, no, they never showed him. I think uh, if they showed him in the finale, it was very brief. Okay. Um, but... They didn't really deal with that at all. That's why I, I would have just, liked some kind of, you know, uh, yes. wrap up episode to see where people yep. wound up. I think I was, maybe I was thinking of the episode where his parents show up and want him to come home. Maybe that's what I what, what I'm thinking. But he doesn't go with them, of course. But yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, back to you, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Um, <laughs> so, so this is a seven who is who is very very different. It makes me wonder at what point. Janeway stopped being in her life. And at what point this desire to fight the world, which is really what it amounts to, mm -hmm. took over. Um, because I have to believe, in my own head canon, something happened between them to cause a rift. Oh, that's, oh that'd be a great novel, wouldn't it? It'd be a great episode. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a great series. And maybe that's why, you know, she, I mean, she, she's obviously bitter because of what happened with Ichab and this whole vengeance run that she's on. But wasn't it another thing that she has to deal with is that she was still part of the collective. She made that very clear to Picard when they were talking about it. And she had to, she has to fight for her humanity every damn day, I think mm -hmm. is how she put it. Yeah. Um, so that's something that she still struggles with after 25 years. 25 years of being separated from the collective, she's still dealing with the collective. Well, and then- And then- oh. She has to go aboard the old Borg cube that the Romulans yep. are, are re repurposing. Yep. And essentially plug into the queen um, yep. lair and control try to control the drones. That was- oh. She becomes a de facto Borg queen. And man, that is chilling. 
It is chilling, and 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 her eyes. I, I don't think I'll ever forget the eyes. And and I didn't realize when they showed an X ray of her when in Stardust City Rag, all of the Borg technology that she still has in her body. We only think she's got the eye thing and the little thing on her cheek and maybe her, on her hand. She's got a lot of Borg technology still in her body, and it was very easy for her to reconnect to the collective. A little too easy, I think. Um. Well, you know, you can take the girl out of the Borg. <laughs> wow. Um, it, it, I, we can't really stop a, a discussion on seven with wondering where she goes now, because at the end of uh, Ed and Arcadia Ego Part Two, the Star, Star Trek Picard season finale, um, there appears to be something more on the horizon with Rafi Musiker. I loved that. Um, and I did, there's more of a connection between those two characters in that scene than there ever is with Chakotay, for God. Yeah, sake. Abs- you're absolutely right. And I loved it. It was a surprise and it was a wonderful and welcome surprise. It, it, both of these characters are hurting characters. Both Rafi and Seven are not in good places. Um, and for them to find each other, it seems it's what they've done. Um, and opens up a whole new world of possibilities with just that little gentle hand, uh, holding at the end as they're sitting at the table. I thought that was great, and I I don't know if we'll see it, but I really hope we see more of it in season two. Whether or not we do or not is anybody's guess. I can only hope that, that Jerry is on board for even more season yeah. two episodes, if not all of them, mm-hmm. because there she is leaving with the crew of the La Serena. So mm-hmm. um, there is a story that is unwritten about Seven of Nine. There is more to learn, and I am all in for the journey. Um, I am psyched that this character is still in our lives or back in our lives. Yeah, me too. And I can't wait to see what her future is because I think she's going to learn even more. I think, I think if she had, I think that's true. I think it will be even more so if she is able, able to have that type of relationship with Rafi that it looks like they might be starting because that opens up all those new possibilities for them to, to experience it together. And I think that'll be great. Something else I've learned is how awesome the band Five Year Mission is, Dan. They are every, every note of music you hear on the Trek Geeks podcast and even on other shows, the Trek Geeks podcast network, my friend. You're just learning that? I, I didn't say that. I just learned it. All right. I thought you did. I said something else I've learned. Okay. You're learned. I am learned. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. You actually come up with that word. I, gotta I did. Pin Thank a you. gold star on your nose. Um it. But we want everyone to head on out to fiveyearmission.net. Get all their albums. Get those CDs in your hand because physical media is awesome. You know, artists, as much as we love listening to them on Spotify and other streaming services, they don't get paid very much when you listen Mm. to it. So you want to help out the band. You want to show them you love them. Get those CDs in your hand. They'll send them to you. All you got to do is order them at fiveyearmission.net. Year one, year two, year three, year four. Trouble with Tribble, Spock's Brain. And coming up someday in the in the distant future, year five, and I imagine that uh, that one's going to be pretty special. But uh, fiveyearmission.net, please show the band some support and go get all their music. Yeah, you can play Frisbee with the physical media too, which is always No, fun. you can't. You can't? I'm sorry. Anyway. No. Okay. Well, we love Five Year Mission. That is, I mean, there's nothing more truer than that. But I got to say, I was watching an episode. Oh, look at you and the video. Too bad you people can't see video because he's holding Spock's brain in year four up right now in front of me. Oh, my God. It's awesome. CDs. I have the CDs. I got one here somewhere. I think they're packed over there. But anyway, um, I was just, you know, watching another episode. We're talking about Seven of Nine. So it, it kind of, it falls right into place this week, I think, Bill. You remember this episode very well. Janeway plans to steal a transwarp coil from a disabled Borg ship so that, of course, they can shorten their journey home. Seven of Nine experiences memories of her going to a concert just before she was assimilated with her parents. And she misses the tour that she so much wanted to be part of. And she wants to rejoin that collective. And then, of course, the hideous Borg Queen returns and tells Seven of Nine that, you know, she'll leave her individuality intact so she can share those memories of being a roadie with the entire collective and then help the queen to assimilate all humanity. Oh my it's word. It's a very scary proposition and it's it's a great episode and I believe it's a two-parter. You can check it out. Fark Frontier. It is it is big, dude. Big B-I-G. Big Zizzle. I'm sorry, what? 
Fark Frontier. That's what I'm talking no, about. No, no. Let's go back to Big Zizzle for a bit. <laughs> Um, because uh, that's something that should never come out of your it's, mouth again. It's not a. It's not a word. It's not even close. I, you know, when I get ex- I get excited about the Farkisms, and sometimes I just kind of blurt stuff out. But the Fark Frontier. Don't even worry about the Big Zizzle thing. We got to talk about Fark Frontier. It's very. Important. Do you think at some point you could get so excited about a Farkism that you could actually blurt out a good one? Wow. So no. <laughs> Don't- <laughs> fiveyearmission.net please go get all their music don't forget you too can support the Trek Geeks podcast network by subscribing to bonus content on Patreon where you can get all kinds of special exclusive perks like laptop stickers and t-shirts and our unparalleled annual supporters pin which we produce with our friends at Fansets every year Dan unparalleled that means not parallel you are so smart. Thank you very much. Right now, we want to take a moment, though, to thank our associate producers for Trek Geeks. We are so grateful for their support. So thank you, Dave Andrews, Vikram Bhatt, Luke Burnham, Brad DeMag, William Edward M. Jr., Brandon Everidge, Andy Fark, Kimberly Francis, Jonathan Hamilton, Brooke Horton, Ryan Jeffs, John Krikorian, Sean Lynn, Jamie McGregor, Aaron Mollenkoff, Shane Murray, Tim Robertson, Greg Rozier, Eric Sakian, Adam Sanders, Tim Serdar, Heather Sohn, Lisa Tomlinson, Jessica Dax Vincent, Trey Womack, Ron Robel, and the gracious and wonderful Conrad Hutchins. I'm almost surprised you didn't pull a Connery with that one. I was gonna, but we've kind of, you know, worn that tire out. How would that sound, though? Because now I want to hear it. I'm the gracious and wonderful Conrad Hutchins. Oh, that's pretty damn good. Thank you very much. <laughs> We also want to thank our Trek Geeks producers for their support. They are Mike Bovia, Chaz Bradshaw, Ken Bird, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Rachel Delaney, Craig Ewing, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Steph Lescu, Leonel Marchand, Matt McGonigal, Jim McMahon, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Jamie Rogers, Casey Shafsky. What? Never heard of him. Chris no, Trebuzio, Ken Tripp, Christina Werther. And the lovely and talented Jess Vashon. You know, listeners, uh, here's some good news for you. You too can become a producer on the Trek Geeks Network, and it is really easy to do. Just head on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks for all the details. Dan, next week, we're going to be taking the week off. But in two weeks, we're going to take a look at some of Starfleet's finest. You know, they've explored strange new worlds and they've they've sought out new civilizations (laughs) <laughs> They've followed and broken the Prime Directive and have had many adventures along the way. We're going to talk about some of our favorite Starship captains and why we're so attached to them in just two weeks on Trek Geeks, the flagship of the Trek Geeks podcast network. <laughs> two weeks, yes. And you're going to need that time to recover <laughs> after trying to read copy. Oh. Of course, uh, for more great Star Trek discussion, please check out the other member podcasts of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. In addition to Rewind, Politrex, and Five Year Mission, you can also hear the brand new Infinite Trek with Aaron Harvey and Brandy Jackala every Tuesday. You can find all of our podcasts, including where to listen, by visiting trekgeeks.com slash listen. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network, no one talks Trek like we do. And of course, for all the news on all the Star Trek CEO, please visit our great friends at treknews.net. For now, this has been episode number 230 of the Trek Geeks podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. Naomi Coconut. Coconut Wild. I was just going to say that. (laughs) (laughs) So there's not one for the stupid board kids? Stupid Coconut Kids. Music for Trek Geeks is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Trek Geeks is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.
Bing bong. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I want a nap. That's yeah. what I want. God almighty. It's, what day is this today? The first day in history? Because it feels like it's, it is. It's Wednesday. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're a little late so, this week, but that's okay. Yeah, we're, we're it's it's been a week. It has. Oh. It's been a week. To the point where uh, lately I haven't had a potent potable during podcasting. Um, but tonight I'm drinking a glass of Snoqualmie Riesling Good. from the great state of Washington. It's, you deserve um, it. And uh, it's it's wonderful. Good. It's just what I wanted. It, it is. It helps. It helps. It helps your dulcet tones. Um, I was going to say it. it uh, it's put me in enough of a frame of mind to be able to talk to you. <laughs> just, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I got a wild blue rain martini. That's my thing these days. Oh, that's although really good. Uh, I did go out to dinner with the family last night. We went to the club, and uh, they had a martini flight of any martinis you wanted. So I had the club, uh, National Country Club. Sorry. Oh, gotcha. um, my brother's. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so my brother's a member there. I saw Judge Smales. <laughs> 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 um, but I had a a grapefruit martini, a an apple martini, and a. I don't remember what the other one was. <laughs> That's because you were two martinis deep when you oh, had it. God, why don't I remember it? Oh, uh, wow. Okay, well, I'll think about it later. Uh, grapefruit pies, huh? Okay, yeah, I don't remember what the other one was. Pomegranate, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But they were awesome. Yeah, they were very good. And then I had poke. I, like, love poke now. I had it at Disney when we went to Disney. I remember. Last I year, remember. And I loved it. And this was phenomenal. I want to go next week just to have that. We, uh, I had a day yesterday too, um, and you did too. Mm-hmm. And of course, yesterday was Tuesday as we yes. record this. Yep. And I wanted tacos, but I also wanted pizza. Uh-uh. So my wife went online, and we don't normally order from Domino's, but oh. they have a taco pizza. Oh my God, really? I did not know that. And it was, uh, I'm not going to lie, it was actually great. Really? Huh. Okay. I, I, I loved it. Pear martini, that was the third one. Oh, <laughs> I knew it. Ro- I knew so I'd remember good. it. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. You, I, I will, I will give you credit. You were a lot braver than I am. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with going out to eat, but I am still not comfortable doing it. We and I appreciate um, that you are. We everybody, you know, everybody has all the staff has masks on. Since it was yep. family, we were more comfortable. It was a huge table, so we were we were spread out quite a bit. Um, but everybody had masks who worked there. Um, anybody coming in had masks on. Um, so it, it was it was fairly safe. Uh, I think it was I think it was safe. Yeah. Um, and uh, it wasn't super super busy, so it wasn't the place wasn't packed. Um, but it was God. I needed that last night. Oh my God. That's was, good. Yeah. It was really it was really a lot of fun. We had a great time. Just like I needed a taco pizza. Mm. Yeah. I was going to say, my wife had fish tacos, so you could have gotten a pizza and then kind of like curled it up like a taco and had a taco pizza. Oh, my God. You know, if, if I had done that, I would have eaten the whole thing and my wife would have not <laughs> had any. Because I guarantee you, I would have mowed that thing <laughs> down. <laughs> like it was the, the world's biggest taco. <laughs> Wow, I actually got a something I said that you actually thought was a good idea. I'm surprised. Wow, we really are screwed up this week. <laughs> this is it is bizarre week, isn't it? Is. It? it really I, is. Um, I I'm you know, we one of the benefits of of doing a Star Trek podcast for five years or having a podcast for five years and having an audience is that you and I have taken the opportunity to become or to open up more and to talk more personally and personably Mm -hmm. with our audience in moments like these. And I got to say, people can probably hear it in my voice. I'm weary. Yeah. You you, you look tired. I am tired. Yeah. You look tired. I mean, usually you look like but you look tired. That's true. (laughs) Bleep that one out. Whoops. Sorry about that. (laughs) Um, I hope you're writing it down because I don't have a pen. (laughs) Yeah, I do. I got it right here. 412, baby. 412. (laughs) Yeah. I just, it's... (laughs) <laughs> it's been it's uh, been crazy. It's been just it's crazy. five months at home with five more to go. Yeah, yep. And it's like funny. So I I contacted facilities at our place of employment today mm-hmm. because there's some stuff in my cube I would like to get. Yeah, I have a lumbar pillow. I have a footrest. You know, I have things that are mine. And so I contacted facilities, and they said, "Well, if you describe the items to us, we can go up to your cube and get them." Yeah, they won't let you. Well, I also wanted to get some of my Legos and some of my Eagle Moss starships. Yeah, all my Eagle Mosses are at the work where they've been since March. But I don't want anyone to touch them. Yeah. 
Is a so I said, I know what that's all about. That's it. And however unintended. Right. And I said, you know what? That's just, that's not going to work for me. I said, because I also want to grab these things and I don't want anyone to touch them because if they accidentally break them, um, that's not good for anybody. No, not at all. And, and the person from facility said, yeah, and they probably sit in a box at security, which isn't great for them either. Right. Yep. So it's going to be five more months before I get to yep. have my little starships. And it's going to be dust all on them. <laughs> I went down yeah. there to pick up my office chair because they finally allowed me to do that. So I was oh, really? to get that. Yeah. They did send out an email that said, hey, you want your office chair? Because you're working at home for the last six months. I didn't get that email. I will send it to you and then you just go and open up a ticket, baby. Ba-boom. I mean, I haven't, as you can see, I'm comfortably your, ensconced your chair, in my Star Trek chair. Yeah, your chair is pretty nice. But what I've been doing is I'm here in the podcast studio with my chair. I've been rolling it out to the end of the um, loft where my workstation is set up. So yeah. anytime I have to come back and forth in between work and here, it's rolling the you chair. You got to bring a chair. Yeah. So now I don't have to do that. So. Well, that's good. Yeah. So that was, that's, a, that's a positive thing. Might as well bring it up now because I'm looking at my at our camera images and I'm seeing the thing behind me. Very bummed about the live thing, having to cancel that. But yeah. it's for the best. It is for the best. So uh, the the Bank of New Hampshire stage, and I, I got to say, they're fantastic. They have been they're fantastic. They've been proactive the entire way. They reached out to us this week and said, "Look, with the state guidelines, effectively we can sell tickets for about a third of the seats of the venue." Yeah, and that's it. Nope. Um, based on the uh, you know the, on the the social distancing guidelines from the state of New Hampshire and, and to try to keep everybody healthy. And this is supposed to be a fundraiser for Granite State Dog Recovery. Um, so we said, well, we, we'll have to, we'll have to cancel the event and yeah. we'd love to do something in the future and they would love us to do something in the mm -hmm. future. Um, but as, as for now, Trek Geeks Live is, is canceled and it's a bummer because we were working on some surprises. Yeah, we really were. Um, both in content and in guesting. Mm-hmm. Um, we, yep. we had a great special guest that was going to show up and, and help us out, yep. um, from Star Trek. But uh, um, it, it, like you said, it, it's the right thing to do. I mean, it is, it really is. And I got to say the, the email that they sent was fantastic. I mean, they're like, oh, all of us are here are Star Trek fans and we're really looking forward to it. So we hope that you'll do something with us in the future. And we will, once this thing is all cleared up, we're definitely going to do this. I mean, I don't have that poster hanging up in my room for not doing it. So we have 100%. to do it now. Yeah. So. Well, we, yeah. we will do it. It will probably be sometime later in 2021. Yeah. Um, the format may change because the world will be a very different place. Exactly. Um, but I, I think it's still important to talk about why Star Trek matters. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that really got me was that uh, and when we made the announcement on our social media, uh, several of our friends who we had no idea were planning to attend. To surprise us, yeah. Mentioned they were planning to yeah. attend. Yep. And it's just one more lost thing in this, yep. you know, convention season has evaporated. Yep. Um, you know, the ability to reconnect with our Trek family is is non-existent mm -hmm. uh, anywhere else other than online. And just knowing that that was the case, it would have made the evening even more special. So now I just have to look forward to seeing you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing me every day. I bet you do. I look forward to seeing you, Bill. You know why? Because you're smart enough. I don't even know the phrase. I'm not going to do it. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. Thank and gosh you. darn it. People, people like, like me. you. Yeah, people do like you. I like you. And I people you. like me more than you. <laughs> oh, that's a, Although, oh my God. Not this kidding. week. No? <laughs> not this week. <laughs> uh, I've, been accused of being, I've been accused of being a racist and a oh, yeah. YouTuber on social oh, media. My God. And... That was the stupidest thing I've ever oh, seen. Oh, my God. Yeah. All really? because I said... Well, it, all because, you know, the the, the union uh, entries in Canada say that Star Trek Strange New Worlds should be starting up on a particular date based on um, the calendar. Right. And all I said was take that with a tremendous Yeah, it wasn't song. even a bad thing. You didn't even say anything negative. I mean, it was crazy. No. Yeah. Because there is an effing pandemic going on. Not because, uh, you know, like half these YouTube you know, losers saying, you know, oh, Kurtzman's been fired and yeah. the new Star Trek sucks. I'm not yeah. saying that at all. No. Uh, there's a pandemic. Things in California, which have already started up, are on the verge of shutting back down again. Yeah. Um, so Trolls. it's anyone's guess. Trolls, they are. Yeah. Oh, well. So Don't, you know what? We're not going to hear from that person anymore. <laughs> new. Uh -uh. Anyway. So let's but, talk positive things. Well, I do want to say it gives me 
an occasion to recognize and be thankful for the thousands of people we interact with online mm-hmm. who are amazing, both as people and as Star Trek fans. Get that right. And I tell you what, that's what's keeping you and me going during all of this. Mm-hmm. Yep. All of the great conversations we have and all of the great comments and all of the, uh, the positivity regarding Star Trek online. Mm-hmm. I tell you what, man, that is carrying me through more days than than people know. And it is awesome. Can you imagine, I don't mean to, uh, this is going to sound mean to people, but it, it's not meant to be. What about those people that don't have Star Trek in their lives? Because that Star Trek is keeping us going right now. And I'm sure other people have stupid things that like Star Wars. And, oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but I was going to say, so, <laughs> so you mean the Firefly fans? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you're right. I mean, we've talked about it many times on the podcast about how, how great it is to have, this thing to keep us going through this and to look forward to it because right now we got we got nothing to look forward to except that positivity in star trek in the future so it's pretty awesome and 20 more weeks of star trek oh my god is it 20 still wow that's a lot and that means 20 more weeks of us (laughs) on discovering (sighs) trek that's a lot of editing especially with you dolts (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't want to hear it because I have to edit you every week and I have for five years. It's the easiest edit you've ever done. How can you edit pure vocal bliss? stupidity? <laughs> well, I don't it's know, like, Mr. Trek Geeps podcast. It's like angels on music notes. It's like angels on crack. <laughs> you remember when I used to have the coughing fits last year? Holy, oh, that was probably fun to edit. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no more fun than that one episode, which will live in infamy about the guest we won't reveal. Um, where there was uh, oh god coughing yeah. fits and yeah and stories that had to be deleted. And, <laughs> and people can ask, we will never we tell. We will not tell. Nope. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. But that was, oof, whoa. Yeah, that was fun. It was a rough one. It was, and you you got through it like a true sailor. Sound. It was the longest edit it's ever taken me. Yeah. Think, it took yeah. me a couple of weeks. Yeah. That was a good one. Um, because I literally had to go through it multiple times. So That was fun. I was just sitting back drinking. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> All right. Oh. Hey, Holy, you ready to do I this? I am ready. Let's do it. All right. Let's get it on. <laughs> 